So I'm here to talk to you about part of the future of neuroscience, which is brain sensing technology. We all know we're in the midst of a sensor revolution. We've heard all about sensors that track your sleep, your steps, your internals, your uh, prescriptions. One thing that's glaringly missing, though, is something that helps the consumer and the patient track their own brain. There's a lot of ways to actually do this. There's a number of different brain-computer interfaces. We have invasive ones like ECOG and BrainGate. We have stimulation technologies like transcranial magnetic stimulation, direct current stimulation, and now ultrasound. We have cumbersome means of tracking one's brain and sending it to a computer like MRI. And then we have fMRI's kind of poor cousin, which is functional near-infrared spectroscopy, FNIRS, and it's able to track the hemodynamic response in a sensor that's only this big and portable. And then, of course, there's EEG. This history of brain-computer interface is actually quite long. We started in the 1970s doing experiments where people could control simple things with their mind using alpha waves. This is David Rosenbaum on the far uh, left-hand side with John Lennon making music with his mind. In the 1980s, we started to see technologies where monkeys could do rudimentary interactions and controls using invasive BCI. The 90s began to let us see inside the head and start to recreate images and uh, concepts from inside the head that could be seen outside. We also started to see things like uh, P300 spellers and BCIs that humans could use to start interacting with their environment. 2005 saw the launch of BrainGate. This is Matt Nagel, the first patient to be implanted with a BrainGate sensor that let him do rudimentary movement through a brain-computer interface. And now, in the late sort of... Er, 2009 to 2014, we've seen the first consumer sensors on the market. Tools that let absolutely everybody tap inside the brain and see what's going on and allow them to interact in some really meaningful ways. For us, we really wanted to transform this thing. This is what EEG used to look like. This is what EEG can look like now. This is Muse, the brain sensing headband. It's a four channel clinical grade EEG and a slim little consumer form factor. There are two channels on the forehead, frontal, and two channels behind the ears. It slips on just like a pair of glasses and connect wirelessly to your smartphone or tablet. We started, uh, it's true clinical grade signal, so this is a comparison of the Muse in red versus ActiChamp, that's a $36,000 clinical grade EEG. Obviously not as many sensors, so you're diminished in the places that you can gain information, but you're really opened up in terms of how you can use this device in practice and in healthcare. I started working with this technology in the early 2000s in the lab of Dr. Steve Mann. There we did our first concerts where people could make music with their own minds. We then said, this is amazing, we can control stuff with our mind, so we went on to create physical things that you could move with your brain. This is the levitating chair, as you would relax, it would detect an increase in your alpha activity and cause the chair to rise towards the ceiling. We've made all sorts of fun stuff like thought-controlled beer taps and thought-controlled toasters, thought-controlled thought slot car machines. Uh, but this is probably the biggest thing we've ever been able to control with people's minds. At the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics, we did a project where people in Vancouver could control the lights in the CN Tower, Canadian Parliament buildings, and Niagara Falls with their mind from across the country. Pretty awesome. This is a smaller version, but possibly more important. This is when BCI starts to tell people about themselves. So this is a responsive environment that we created in stereoscopic 3D that could tell the user when they were focused and when they were relaxed. And that would cause the environment to change in response to their brain state, giving the user valuable information about themselves and allowing them to control something far more impressive than the CN Tower, their own mind. We all know we've got a kind of crisis of the brain that's going on. Two billion people worldwide suffer from brain-based health and productivity challenges, and they have very few solutions these days. You look at ADHD, when nine kids are diagnosed with ADHD, 90% of them are given Ritalin. 
Stress-related illness, anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of every single case you see walk into your doctor's office is due to a stress-related illness, with very little mechanism to help people actually understand, manage, and control their stress. Sleep, $63 billion is lost annually due to poor sleep, and we all know how much our patients suffer trying to solve these problems. So we created Muse Calm. Muse Calm tracks your brain activity in real time, sends it to your smartphone or tablet, and then gives the user real-time feedback on their brain activity, and an exercise that they can do to help them improve their cognitive function and decrease their stress. So in Muse Calm, we let people hear their own mind. The metaphor that we use is that your mind is like the wind. When you're thinking, ruminating, distracted, you hear it as windy. And as you come to a state of clear, focused attention, you quiet the winds. This very simple exercise, going from states of distraction to focused attention, allows people to do some really important things. It helps you build your state of attention, which helps you avoid external distractions, sounds, lights, things in your environment. It also helps you avoid internal distractions, those negative thoughts, feelings, ruminations, the things that come up that take you away from where you want to be. Some of you may be thinking this sounds a little bit like a gamified mindfulness tool. It is. In, mindful, in mindfulness, you do a focused attraining, attention attraining, focused attention training exercise where you bring your mind back to the object of your attention. Every time your mind wanders, it's your job to bring it back. Now, in meditation, you have to know when your mind has wandered, and it may be one, three, five minutes before you bring it on back. Here, within a matter of seconds, you know. So you can essentially get in more bench press reps at the gym. And for all of you who say, OK, am I meditating? Is this working? Am I doing this right? Here you get real-time feedback so you know what your brain is doing and you remain on track. You can also see your progress. You can see what your brain was doing at every moment of the intervention. And you can see how you improve over time. We have thousands of people who are using this now. And they're for reporting results from decreased anxiety, decreased depression, improved sleep. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to just go on Amazon and see the reviews there and see how people are using it themselves. There's one woman whose husband had cancer. And she said, I've been using Muse to deal with the stress of my husband's cancer and his doctor appointments, and I'm nicer to my kids, more supportive to my husband, and feel like I'm becoming a better person. There's another woman who had cardiac arrhythmia, and she, entirely not on our advice, uh, has been using Muse in the absence of using her medication and has noticed improvements in her arrhythmia, i.e. she's had none. So you have a whole range of consumers who are implementing these devices on their own and finding benefits. I think it's really interesting to find out what, what happens when we bring this inside the system and control it and manage it in important ways to deliver this care meaningfully to your patients. We also have another interesting aspect, which is we have thousands of people engaging in EEG every single day with beautiful tagged data sets. This provides an amazing opportunity for neuroscientists to actually look at this data and begin to understand changes in population over time with a way that one hasn't been able to before. So we did a fun thing. We just looked at a very simple marker inside of our data set, AlphaPeak. Uh, it's known in the literature that alpha peak decreases with age, uh, but it's really not been known how it decreases and how it decreases decade by decade. Let's take a look. So this is a distribution of alpha peaks of uh, folks in their 20s who use Muse. We have thousands and thousands of users, so this is a very large database. You can see that the alpha peak peaks at 10 and then trails off, sorry, peaks 11 hertz and trails off. Well, this is what happens when you're 30. This is what happens when you're 40 when you're 50, when you're 60, and when you're 70. Kind of awesome. So we can actually see the decrease, the downshift in alpha peak over time. We can also see something that the data has, uh, that clinical data has never reported, which is an increase in alpha power as you age. We did a very simple little um, look at our data and looked at male versus female differences during our neurofeedback paradigm. And we noticed that females tend to have significantly higher power at higher frequencies starting at alpha and beyond. There's lots of ways to interpret this data. So we're doing over, I think, over 50 research labs now are currently using Muse, both as a clinical grade EEG and as a tool with Muse Calm. They're looking at epilepsy. 
Um, this can be obviously used to track epileptic seizures throughout the day, not just when you're in the doctor's office. If you're looking at ADD, kids with ADD have high levels of theta waves, dream state, lower levels of beta waves, focus state. When you teach kids to upregulate beta and downregulate theta, like by playing a video game that they drive forward with their focus, they can improve their ADD symptoms as effectively as Ritalin. Kind of astounding. Anxiety, cardiac care, there's a facility in Canada looking at cardiac patients and demonstrating decreases in cardiac events using Muse. Mayo Clinic is just about to start a study with breast cancer sufferers, looking at how they decrease stress during their treatment and improve their decision-making outcomes. So lots of opportunity once you take tools like this and you can bring them widely into the hands of consumers and patients. When we look down the next decade of this technology, in the short term, you're going to see almost half a million of these devices by myself and my colleagues in the space over the next two years. That's half a million consumer EEGs in people's hands. You're also going to see these in clinical practice. Forward-looking clinics are going to start to take these into their practices and give them to their patients instead of anxiety medication or depression me medication as a first-line preventative approach. You're also going to start to see FDA approvals rolling out. Uh, last year marked the approval of beta-theta ratio as a diagnostic for ADHD. In five years, you're going to start to see insurers and payers come, come on board with all of these kinds of sensor technologies. We're starting to see them get over the hill. By five years, all of this is going to be reimbursed. You're also going to see the consumer acceptance of stimulation technologies, which are a few years behind passive reading technologies in terms of consumer uh, approval, but not necessarily in terms of um, clinical effect. By 10 years down the road, these kinds of devices are going to look very different. They'll be significantly smaller. They might be just a simple little tattoo like you see from MC10. They may be embedded in other technologies. Actually, they will be in things like a Google Glass. And it's going to be really standard for the average consumer to monitor their devices and their um, signals, including their EEG. By 20 years down the road, this kind of technology is going to be a natural part of our daily lives. And our technology is going to know what's on our minds and use that data to present it back to us. So anxiety and depression isn't going to be something where you take a pill. Anxiety and depression is going to be something that your iTunes playlist detects and then suggests music it knows in the past has made you calm or happy. Our technology will understand what's on our mind and create constant interventions to help support us in our daily lives. Today, we're starting to see this being deployed right now. And we all have the opportunity to change healthcare and to change how people understand and manage what's on their own minds. Thank you. Time to speak.